We have you stand up and down. I just want to keep you all awake. The fans are going, but don't let your mind tell you that it's blowing cold air. We have the vents uh, doing what the building was designed to do. They're blowing the hot air up so that we can get the air, the warm air over here. And so those fans just gently push that warm air down. And so I believe I'm being told we have a very uh, good feel across the auditorium right now. It's not overly hot over here, and it's definitely not overly cold over here as normal. And so thank you for being patient. Sometimes you'll say, oh, the fans are on. I need my coat. My bones hurt. I'm just going to fall apart. And it's your mind. So I wanted to help you. I forgot to talk to you about the married couples getaway. Put those dates in your calendar. It's April 19th through the 21st. We're going back to Ocean City, Maryland. It's a beach or it's a hotel on the beach and it's just fantastic. It's beautiful and the cost is the same as it was last year. No inflation here at the Calvary Baptist Church. It's $400 a couple. That includes two night stay in a beautiful ocean view room. It includes this year a full breakfast uh, on Friday and Saturday morning. Last year it was just danishes and stuff. This year it's a full breakfast and I'm looking at our coordinator Mrs. Morrison right uh, on Friday and Saturday and then you get a dinner included in that on Friday night there at the hotel plus two great sessions on marriage and please come and plan on coming we want to announce it a little bit ahead because as we get taxes back some of you you need to take that four hundred dollars and put it towards uh, the married couples getaway you say why pastor because four hundred dollars is cheaper than a divorce I say that every year it's true some of you are nodding your heads. You're like, yeah, but I'm testifying. Yeah, 400. And you come and, and then bring some extra spending money so that you could take care of your Thursday night dinner and uh, so on and so forth, whatever else you'd like to spend. But that 400 includes a lot. And thank you for working that out. As we get uh, closer, we'll have more details. If you have any questions, see Mrs. Morrison, please. In Luke chapter 19 and verse number 10, it says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That is a very, very pointed verse into the reason why Jesus came. Jesus came at the command of God his Father, and he came for one purpose, to seek and to save that which was lost. He goes on in this, in this chapter to give these parables, and as he begins to talk to them and he begins to convey certain things, he is pointing out the reason why he's come, to seek and to save that which was lost. If we are to be Christ-like and if we are to take the theme of our church and make it the theme of our life, we have to understand the importance of why he came. Because the reason, fellows, over here, why he came is then passed on to us to continue. For we are designed to continue the work of Christ, not to start a work in and of ourselves. And as we look today, everybody in your bulletin should have got this acrostic. It should say souls, and I'd like for you to take that out, put it in your Bible there, because those five points, S-O-U-L-S, are the f uh, five points, they're fine, we've got them, are the five points of this morning's message, souls. I want to give you just, it's not an acrostic I found online. It's just an acrostic that I came up with as I've been praying for this theme. And I'd like for you to keep it in your Bible, utilize it, and as we go through it, let's remember why Jesus came, and let's accept the responsibility to go and do thou likewise. Father, I pray that you'd be with Brother Robinson as he sings this morning. And Lord, I thank you for him and his leadership as our youth pastor and uh, really running our, our computer programs and so many things that he does for us. And Lord, I thank you for gifting him with such a wonderful voice. And I pray that once again, that we'd be blessed by his song. I pray you'd fill me with your power as I stand in just a moment to preach the word of God. May we leave changed. May we leave having been helped by the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated.
so much as we look here at Luke chapter 19 for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost I am proud to say that the people of Calvary Baptist Church have really taken this theme of 2012 to heart and you are applying it to your life I'm hearing often of the folks that you are leading to Christ the folks that you're telling about Christ I've ran into folks who have just stopped by the church during the week to run in and grab some more tracks because you're sowing seed and you're telling people about our Lord. This is a great, great thing. It is the purpose of the Christian life. If we are to be Christ-like, then we are to do the work of Christ. And this is the work of Christ, to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, I can't save them, but through Christ I can seek them. And I can go out to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. I've been praying over this theme this year and well, even before the year began. And as I prayed over it, I began to think, what are souls? And we know and we've found over the last many weeks that if we go to Genesis chapter 2, if you turn there quickly, Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 7. In Genesis 2, verse number 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And we learned that the very first Sunday of 2012, that man became a living soul because of the breath of God. So as we look at the acrostic of souls, the title of the message, we find that S would mean supernatural gift of life it's a supernatural gift of life that we have you see after God bent down and formed man out of the dust of the ground he stooped even lower and breathed into man the very breath from his own lungs the breath of God and man became a living soul and may I remind us this morning that same breath has been passed to all people of every nation under heaven all because God breathed into Adam that breath of life that same breath was passed on to Eve that same breath is passed on to every one of us who sit here and take a breath from God's incredible system that we call the universe and we take that breath breath that came from Adam but it first came from God and the life that we lead today and the life that we live and sometimes so selfishly claim as our own was actually supernaturally given by that very breath of God so as we hoard our life and as we take our breath and we waste it on the things of the world we're actually slapping God in the face 
because what I have in this breath is a very gift from God. And as we look at the S, we find it's a supernatural gift. As a saved believer, my breath is to be used to tell others how they might have heaven as their home. You know, whenever somebody comes into my office for counseling, as we begin talking about counseling, if it's the first time that I've met them, the very first question that I ask, and some may think it generic, and some may think it's just a cop-out, and others would say, that's just, he's just a Baptist preacher. But I believe it's very biblical, because in order to solve a problem, we must first make sure we have the right foundation. And so I'll ask him this question. If you died today, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? And I've had some say, we were told you're an asset. I just, I just don't think that's important. And I say, that's the most important thing. How can I have a good marriage if I don't have Christ in my heart? You see, some people were trying to, to love God, but were trying to love God without ever accepting His Son. And, and your belief in God you may have, but you'll never experience the true love of God until you accept the Son of God. For it's after I accept the Son of God and I realize that because of the Son of God I have heaven, I then look at the giver of the Son of God, God Himself. And I have to thank God. And as I purpose in my heart, and as I purpose in my own marriage, my wife is up here, and as we purpose in our child rearing to put God first and foremost, I begin to see that there is an answer to every problem, and that answer is God. Amen. That answer is God. We sometimes uh, uh, say, well, I just need counseling. No, you need God. Counseling helps, but some of the greatest counseling you'll ever receive is through the preaching of God's Word. So be here Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. It's not just an idea that we, well, let's just, let's just see how many times we can go to church. Let's do it the Bible way then, and let's go to church every day of the week. You die. And we look here into the scriptures and we say, well, well, I, I, I do, I believe in God, but do you believe in his son? Do you believe that Jesus died on a cross, was buried, and rose again? You say, I do. Then why don't you take the head knowledge and allow it to become heart knowledge today? Because the breath that I have is not for me to live selfishly. It's for me to live selflessly. It's for me to give to God. And say, God, I want to thank you for the supernatural gift of life. Number two in the acrostic, we find obviously not only S, but O. As I looked at the word souls, the O would have to mean that others depend on us. Others depend on us. And we've been preaching it. It's not with arrogance that, yeah, I'm needed. It's not all about me. As a matter of fact, it has nothing to do with me except for the fact that I've been given that supernatural gift of life. Now I must understand that I, as a saved believer, am shouldered with the responsibility. And I must bear that as a good steward of my Lord and God. I must bear that responsibility to the nations, to my city, to the world around us. Why? Because others depend on me. They depend on what God's given me, salvation. Who am I to hoard that wonderful gift of God? Who am I to, to keep just within the, the, the portals of my own heart, salvation? Well, I want to shout it from the rooftops. I want to go to a mountaintop and just shout to the world, you must be born again. And I can do that when I realize that others depend on me. Do you know that if you're saved today, others depend on you? Others depend on us. They depend on us to tell them about Jesus Christ. Somebody recently had asked me about these tribes in the dark jungles of Africa or in the, the, the little tribes that are offset in India and around our world. What happens to those who never heard? Well, I believe during the tribulation they'll be given a chance to hear. But what happens to those who die having never heard? They die and go to hell. You say, would a loving God do that? It's not, it, we can't take that and point at a, at a God for that. Our God provided somebody for them that should have went and told. But here's what happens. 
How many of us here today, and don't raise your hand, but how many of us here today, if we died, know for sure that heaven would be our home? And we know that. And we say, I know, I know, Brother Snipes, if I died right now, I know I'm going to heaven. Praise the Lord. But how many of us are willing to go to that tribe that we've never heard of? How many of us are willing to raise our children to surrender their heart and life to go to that tribe? Oh, no. We teach our children, we want you to live next door to us and raise your grandbabies here, and, and we want to have everybody close. And God says, it's not about closeness with your family. It's about closeness with me. Somebody may never hear because we don't understand that others depend on us. And the good news of the gospel is shared by those of us who know Christ because it can't be shared by those who don't. And so throughout the world, if we were to take and have a raise of hands of people who know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, hands would go up all across our world. But if we were to have hands of people we call missionaries, and we said, if you're a missionary, would you raise your hand? There's so few and far between. It's not that God didn't make somebody to go and tell every nation under heaven. It's that we started using that supernatural life selfishly and we started saying no I won't go and then when I say no to something that God's called me to do guess what my children are gonna do my children are gonna learn to say no to something that God's called them to do I wasn't created for my own purpose I was created for his purpose and when I received that supernatural gift of life 34 years ago, God had a plan for Cameron Giovanelli. When you received that supernatural gift of life however many years ago, you had a purpose within the master plan of God. And it's your responsibility, like it's my responsibility, to say, yes, I'll go. I'll shoulder the responsibility that God has created me for. I won't shy away from it. I won't run away from it. But I will surrender my life to the Lord Jesus Christ because others depend on us. And we find as we look at souls the supernatural gift of life. We find, number two, that others depend on us. And as you scroll down your handout there, we find the you. The untold gospel means hell. The untold gospel means hell. And as we look at Romans 10 and verse number 14, we find that it says, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How would one believe in Jesus Christ? How would they understand that they have to put their faith and trust in Jesus as their Messiah who shed his blood and who gave himself sacrificially so that we might live forever in eternity in heaven? How would they know that if the story's never told? So as we look at the soul, we find the supernatural gift of life. We find that others depend on us. And we find that you would have to mean that untold gospel means hell. If they never hear, the word gospel means good news. If they never hear the good news, where else are they going to go? Where else? An untold gospel means hell for somebody. So I want to tell my neighbors about Christ. I want to tell my family about Christ. I want to tell my children about Christ. And I want to put my children in a place where they're going to continually hear about Christ. And I want to, I want to tell everybody I can about the Lord Jesus Christ. I understand that I can't stop everybody in the grocery store and have conversation with all those people. But I can hand a track out. When a little kid, my daughter and I, the other uh, evening, Matt, uh, Meredith and I jumped in the car really quick, ran down to Giant, grabbed a little thing of cookies, and grabbed a thing of, of sherbet, and we were getting ready to head for the, the, the cash register, and as we did, a little girl came racing around the corner and ran right into me. And her dad said, oh, I'm sorry for that. And I said, oh, I said, don't worry about that. I said, I'm Pastor Giovanelli from Calvary Baptist Church. Well, there went his daughter again. Now, that wasn't the time to say, now, sir, forget about your daughter. You listen to me. If you died right now, you're going to hell. It wasn't the time. But in the few seconds, I handed him this card. I don't know what he'll do with it, but I know one thing on the back of it. It tells you the Bible way to heaven. 
So maybe as a daddy, he'll go home and he'll set that somewhere. And he may pick it up. He may have picked it up that night. He may pick it up in the days or weeks to come. But the fact of the matter is, he's got something right now in his house that will tell him if he'll read it, it'll tell him what the Bible says about heaven. Amen. Planting a seed. You see, some of us just need to make it a habit to just plant a seed. Everywhere you go, plant a seed. Why? Because we've been given a, nat a supernatural gift called life. Others depend on us. And an untold gospel means hell for somebody. And I don't want that somebody to ever look at me in heaven and say, oh, I knew him. I know him. And then say, why didn't you ever tell? An untold gospel means hell. We find the L in souls means life in heaven depends on the purity of the gospel. Life in heaven depends on the purity of the gospel. In John 14, 6, we know it, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Do you understand that in our world today, there is a message preached that you can go to heaven, but you, for in some religions, you go to heaven if you do this. Some, you go to heaven if you do this. Others, if you do this, or if you do this, or if you do this. And it's such a confusion. And when folks come into a church like Calvary Baptist Church, of which there are many, when they come into Calvary Baptist Church, they hear the simple plan of salvation. And the devil has confounded and confused their minds so much that many will walk out and say, that's just too easy. And they'll say, that's, that's too easy. I don't know about that. So we're Catholic and we feel religious because we're doing this and we're doing this and we've done our confessions. But God said in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So if it's not of works, what is it? And by the way, if it's not of works, it discredits just about every other religion on the face of this earth except those of us that are preaching a Bible way to heaven. Amen. We look and we say, well, well, pastor, that's just too easy. And I just have to look and say, really? What was easy about a man stepping out of eternity into time? What was easy about the Word becoming flesh and dwelling amongst men? What was easy for 33 and a half years living a sinless life? What was easy about being taken from the garden where he prayed and led down to Caiaphas Hall where he was beaten by his own and his own received him not and his beard was plucked out by the Roman soldiers when his own people delivered him over to the Roman rule? What was so easy about a cat of nine tails being whipped across his pack and torn away so that he was left looking like a piece of hamburger meat, unrecognizable by man. What was easy about being taken and thrown into a courtyard and led outside the city gates of Jerusalem and led up to a hill called Calvary? What was so easy about being nailed to a cross where nails were driven through his hands and through his feet? What was so easy about a crown of thorns being embedded into his brow. What was so easy about being raised in the air and with the thud of that cross as it settled in the ground where the hole had been dug, all the joints of his body were loose. I ask you this morning, what was so easy about becoming the Savior of the world? I think it's easier to depend on my own works. I think it's easier to preach to you today that you just do this and do this and do this and you'll get to heaven. But without Christ, there is no heaven. And without faith and trust in the God-given Messiah, the Son of God, there is no heaven for us. So you say it's easy. I say it was very hard. But Jesus just left the easy part up to me. Because he could have required me to do all that. But I wouldn't have lived through it. I don't think I would have made it to the cross. Because I know me. So really, was it easy? 
Or did he just leave me the easy part? Isn't that what we parents try to do for our children? We try and take some of the difficulties in our life and train our children so that they might do it better and not have the rough life that I had. Is my child not qualified to be an adult because we tried to make life easier? Absolutely not. Am I not qualified to be saved because all I have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved? The hard part's been done. Thank God for his son who now stands as the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But may I say to you this morning, life in heaven depends on the purity of the gospel. Under your, on your uh, card there, in blue it says Jesus plus nothing, minus nothing. Jesus plus nothing, minus nothing. You take away the blood, you can't have salvation. You take away the virgin birth, you can't have salvation. You take away the sinless life, you can't have salvation. You take away the resurrection, you can't have salvation. You add works, you can't have salvation. You add any humanity on our part into this equation, you cannot have salvation. It's Jesus plus nothing, minus nothing. It's all about Him. I don't do good to get saved. I try and do good because I am saved. I don't work for God to get to heaven. I work for God because I'm going to heaven. And we have to understand that salvation must be given in its purity. And the world tries to tarnish it. And the devil, in his cunning wisdom, has confused the world about the only one who can save people from their sin. And if he can just... Well, it's good, that, it's good that you tell them about Jesus, but go ahead and tell them this is how you can get to heaven, and he makes it false. No, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We find, as we look at the acrostic of souls, it's a supernatural gift of life. Others depend on us. Untold gospel means hell. Life in heaven depends on the purity of the gospel. And that last letter, S, souls, someone must go and tell. Someone must go and tell. If our theme for the year is souls, then we need to understand what that means. Once we understand what that means, then we need to accept the responsibility and say, I'll be that someone. Because I can't tell them all. Our church staff can't tell them all. The leadership of the Calvary Baptist Church can't tell them all. You meet people that I'll never meet. And I meet people that you'll never meet. God has placed us all in a unique situation. It's our responsibility to tell others how they might know Christ as our Savior. For the Bible also says that their blood will be required at my hand and come judgment day. I'd rather not have a bucket of blood. Oh, I know I'll have some because I failed. But I'd rather my failure. Sit down, son. I'd rather my failure be very minimal and my reach go far. I can't do it all. It's not about me. But I have been shouldered with a responsibility because I'm saved. I want to be that someone who will go and tell. How about you? The Bible says in Romans 10, 14, at the end, and how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they hear without a preacher? In Matthew 28, 19, and 20, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. In Mark chapter 16 and verse uh, uh, number 15, it says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Preach. We're all to preach the gospel. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, 
To some I ask you, do you know Christ? Has there ever been that time where you allowed that head knowledge to become heart knowledge? Don't convince yourself you're going to heaven because you go to church and you're a good person. That's, the, that's what the devil wants you to believe. It's Jesus plus nothing minus nothing. I go to heaven when I believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And I go to heaven when I can accept the fact that because of my sin, I deserve hell, but because of Jesus, I've been set free. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, and I'm looking in the balcony and also on the lower floor, you say, Pastor, if I died this morning, I don't know for sure that I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to know. Would you slip your hand up and let me pray for you? You're here this morning, and we're focused on nothing else, but you say, Pastor, if I died this morning, I do not know for sure that I'd go to heaven, but I would like to know that for sure before I leave today. Would you let me pray for you? Is there anybody like that? You'd raise your hand. I see a hand over here. God bless you. Is there anybody else this morning? I see this hand right over here. God bless you. Is there anybody else? Up in the balcony here on the lower floor. Pastor, please pray for me. Is that parent C? Good. Thank you. I'll let you deal with that. Church family, you're here this morning. Would you accept this responsibility? Can we accept it together? You see, I just don't know. I, I don't know if I could do it. It doesn't matter. It's a command. God will equip those who surrender. He will help us. But we've got to do this as a team. But we've also got to do it as individuals. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'm going to pray. Mrs. Beard is going to sing. As she sings and we stand in a moment, would you join me at the altar church and say, Lord, I'll be that someone. I'll shoulder that responsibility. I'll do it to the best of my ability through Christ. Father, I pray that you'd bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand together, would you come from the balcony and on the lower floor? Would you use the altar and say, Lord, use me. I want to do my part to tell somebody because it would greatly grieve me if somebody never heard because I didn't tell. We all have co-workers. We all have family and friends. We all have people that we know. Pray that God will give you wisdom in how to approach them. But make sure that we approach them. As Brother Robinson comes to close the invitation. to come. If you need to make a decision, there's altar workers down here at the end of each aisle as she sings another verse.
so much for the message we heard today. Father, it's all about souls. Help it to sink in, Father, as we hear over and over the message of soul winning and your great commission. And, and Father, I pray so much that it would weigh heavy on the hearts of our members here and even those that attend or that are visiting today. Father, I pray if there be anybody that's not saved, that doesn't know you as their Savior, that they would get it settled before today's over with. In your name, amen. Grace Westbrook has come. You may be seated to get baptized today, and so you'll see that. And uh, while we wait on that, Brother Jerry's going to lead us in a verse of song. Take your song books, number 55, At the Cross, 5-5, five, five, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. She got saved recently and is coming forward to get baptized. This is one of our little girls. Did you ask Jesus into your heart, Montana? Good. Montana, upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my little sister. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in likes of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. This is little Gracie right here, and I've got Daddy Westbrook right there, and Mom Westbrook right here. And Gracie got saved last Sunday night, last Sunday, and Grandma and Grandpa are out there. You see him? There's your brother right there in the middle. There you go. And Gracie, have you asked Jesus to save you? Upon your profession of faith, my dear little sister, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death. Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> Wonderful. The ushers have come. Hey, the ushers, you have a third usher right behind you over here, right over your shoulder. Hey, would you help with the Beast Feast? You say, what's the Beast Feast? Each year, we bring probably four to 500 men right here onto this property. On It's March 10th this year. We give out things, we provide food, we do a lot for them, and we do something for the ladies as we get to May, the ladies' extravaganza. And this year for the ladies, we're doing a luau, and yours is actually Friday night and Saturday morning, so it's going to be pretty big, and you'll have a great time with that. But for the men, it's on March 10th from noon to 4. Would you drop something in the plate really quick just to help us? All this money goes towards our Beast Feast. And so as the piano plays, would you give quickly, please, and I'll be right down. 